Now you might be thinking, well this is all well and good if you have time to prepare and are in control, but what about more spontaneous moments? Well that's where Ross's dynamic seven step process comes in. So we move on to part four, the seven step dynamic explanation, explanation if you want to take it away. Yeah, so in controlled settings, we craft explanations meticulously, yet, it, well, we should, following this, um, <laughs> following what we just talked about, um, yet in fluid situations beyond our control, meeting communication expectations becomes trickier. To address this, you'll build upon existing techniques and learn to articulate your message, irrespective of the questions posed. These are the seven steps, but this time with a slight twist. So one, you want to set up, two, find the information, three, distill the information, four, organize the information, five, verbalize, six, memorize, and the seventh part is questions. So, Jess, you want to take us away? Yeah, so steps one to three is prepare the information. The initial steps remain exactly the same as before. So after completing them, you have a list of essential information. However, it will not yet be organized. So this is the only where it starts getting different. So from step four, we've got organize the information. So this is where our approach shifts from a controlled versus dynamic explanation. In presentations or essays, we retain ample information within each strand. But in dynamic situations, we streamline each strand significantly. The reason is simple. Making a presentation or essay allows for a relaxed assembly, but verbal answers demand immediate construction. Hence, our building blocks must be straightforward, memorable and practical, which kind of reminds me of like, you know, he's talking before about the sort of bullet points. Yeah. It kind of that's the best way to do a dynamic expl explanation. Yeah. Isn't it? It's kind of having the rough ideas of what you want to say. So depending on the size of the subject you're working on, you might have three strands or several. Regardless, for each distinct section of the subject, strive to limit the elements to five. The structure should start with a primary point, followed by some facts and then the context. So it should look something along the lines of this. You have strand A, primary point, fact, 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 then the context as bullets. And you have exactly the same for strand A, strand B, strand C. Um, so I think he gives an example here. So the strand is organizing large events. The primary point is extensive experience across event types and countries. The fact is product managed a 2000 person conference. The other fact is responsibility for budget, personnel and marketing. The other fact is freelance event organizer in five countries. And the context is recently promoted to head of events at current company. And I believe this is like a good job spec. Yes, something yeah, like something yeah. uh, like promoting credibility. Exactly. So yeah, it can be useful. Uh, sorry, it can also be useful to group the strands so that you thought about them, uh, which ones connect closely together. This will allow you to move from one strand to a related one more easily, which kind of makes sense. You're ordering the A, B, C with the ones that sort of link together potentially once again here using the joining phrases we discussed earlier yeah. exactly um, i mean this all makes a lot of sense it's just having a bit of structure to follow some some kind of structure that you can put all your information in when you're thinking about it or when you're about to answer a question or explain something um yeah, yeah it's just a basic you know, i think it's quite funny as well i think one of the ways of thinking about it is kind of when you see people on tv go this is good for two reasons boom boom it's kind of they've almost I mean, if they're probably prepared, they would have those two reasons bullet points in yeah. their head, right? But that's kind of the way you got to be thinking. Like, these are the three points I want to talk about. So this is the three points I want to convey. Boom, boom, boom. Um, and then context, why it matters or whatever. Yeah. yeah, no, absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So quick check at the end of this chapter. Are your strands of information clearly defined? And are you happy with the information you have in, uh, have within each strand? Yeah. So once you've organized all your information, the next step is to familiarize yourself with it. And one effective way of doing that is to verbalize it. Yes. So step five, verbalize. So in any interaction, your brain is multitasking, understanding queries, formulating responses, selecting relevant knowledge, estimating time constraints, and assessing the audience's information needs. Front loading some of these calculations in advance makes decision making more efficient. Verbalization is crucial in helping with this as it creates a network of connections around the information, making it more usable. Speaking helps identify effective phrases, points, ideas, and confident use of names. And it really, like, I, I really resonate with this point. I think it's, I keep seeing it pop up in loads of books now because the idea of just like verbally talking through what you're, what you want to explain ahead of time, one, it gets used to, you used to like, you know, speaking it through and familiarizing yourself with the words and the phrases and the tone and whether you like it, whether you want to like, you know, avoid something or not. Um, 
And I think neurologically or psychologically, it helps you think of other things that you may not have thought thought of before, what might connect, what doesn't. Um, and yeah, so I think it's a really... Yeah, exactly. What sounds natural when you're saying it? Because it might it might look logical on the yeah. paper, but the moment you speak yeah. it out loud, you're kind of like, mm, would I would I say it this way? Does that make the best sense to structure it this way? Exactly. And like, how many times have you received an email where it's like so unbelievably <laughs> formal, and then you're like, but no one actually speaks like this. You know, it sounds a bit odd, yeah. but because it's written, you kind of just accept it anyway. Whereas, yeah, when you oh, you're right. If they spoke it out, yeah, imagine like a voice note, or the equivalent. Of yeah, that. exactly. Best wishes. Yeah. <laughs> kind of regard yes. oh that's weird so you want to verbalize each strand so number one connect two strands together selecting two strands and transition smoothly from one to the other considering the flow between them experiment with various combinations of strands observing how they complement or contrast with each other then two you want bridging phrases so in dynamic explanations transitioning between strands smoothly is essential Bridging phrases facilitate seamless transitions without specific content, ensuring flu fluid movement between strands. Some examples include emphasizing one area, another is, or there is more than one aspect to consider, such as, or another key point. And we were talking about this before, like, you know, essentially you just want these in your repertoire, something that is so easy and it like is already embedded in how you naturally speak. So if you could just go around saying these to yourself all day, right? So that they start to get like neurologically imprinted in your kind of language, then you can start using this all the time. Be like, yes, that was a great point. And then onto this one. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, once again, I don't understand why he's called it bridging phrases. It's exactly the same as joining yeah. phrases in my head. It's just phrases that link ideas together or points exactly. or just continues the conversation on. Yeah, no, 100%. I was a bit confused by that as well, to be fair. Um, all right, so then this next section is in search of time. In dynamic situations, while organizing thoughts may seem challenging, there are pockets of time to capitalize on. With more time, we can make informed decisions in response to others. It involves not just knowing where to look, but understanding the subtle patterns of conversation clues, extracting valuable information. By immersing ourselves in the information of our explanations beforehand, we can gradually chunk it, which we'll get onto in a, mi in a moment. Um, but this is crucial as it empowers us to leverage the pockets of time within a conversation more effectively, enabling us to retrieve more information within the same time frame. And I, I love this point, actually, when I came across it, because I was like, oh, yeah, that's actually so clever. You want as much time to think about your response as possible while still being tuned in and hearing them. But if you can like he talks about this in a minute with questions, but also if you can identify certain areas where there are pockets of time, or if you can familiarize yourself with your, with your content beforehand, then you can start to chunk it. And then it's much easier to retrieve. You don't have to retrieve a million different things. You can retrieve one because it's all chunked into one. Um, and I think that's such a clever idea. Uh, I've never thought of that before. And I, I really liked it. Um, so quick check. Have you verbalized your information so that it feels comfortable to say? And are you comfortable moving between different strands of information? So it's one thing to talk about chunking information, but what does it truly entail? Essentially, it's a method of memorization, which marks step six in our process. And step six is memorize. So to convey clearer explanations in dynamic situations, you must effortlessly access pre-prepared information, chunks, and arrange them based on the context of the inquiry. So in this chapter, he goes on some sort of, um, I guess, basic or, yeah, basic principles of memory mm -hmm. techniques. So identifying information, learning its order, and labeling it, it as a single entity, sorry, is the essence of chunking. The next level is to order these chunks and remember them as a single entity. Aim for around 10 to 20 chunks, avoiding overload for better retention. And if needed, you can split your strands into separate chunks with distinct labels. You can highlight bold or summarize content instead of requiring, it, requiring to say it word for word. Invest time into this process. The more you do it, the easier it will become. This memory process is the ability to transform your communication from perfect to natural. I think that's a really yeah. good point. I think like, if you memorize stuff from word to word, you kind of lose your natural authenticity of the way you communicate. Yeah. And you almost what you really want, which is kind of what you're getting at here, is the ability to remember the information as a chunk or as a story of which 
all you kind of do to yourself is prompt yourself, okay, what was next? What chunk was yeah. next? And the, the word itself can remind you of what you wanted to say, yeah. or maybe two words remind you of what you wanted to say. And then you just convey it in the most authentic, for lack of a better word, way of way of saying it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're just like little folders that contain lots of information rather than remembering all the information and getting overwhelmed by it. Um, yeah, it makes sense to have these kind of techniques in place. Yeah, for sure. So utilizing the three memory methods for effective recall. So number one is the link method or the story method. So you create a story touching on five subjects in a specific order and you retell the story for sequential recall. It's quite, it kind of makes mm. sense, doesn't it? Like what follows logically next. And once you start the story, you kind of, as long as you know where it ends and you do sort of the main things that happen, you're not going to forget <laughs> yeah. it, right? Oh yeah. Well, you hope. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so number two is the journey method. So you associate and attach information you want to remember to familiar routes and locations, e.g. the journey you take to the supermarket or the, the journey you take to go to the local cafe or, gym, or something along like those that. lines. Anything that yeah. is familiar to you so that you can just assign these chunks along the way. Yeah. And then, and then the, the step up from the journey method, which is the memory palace, which is literally almost the same as the journey method, except for you involve associating the details with specific areas in your house. Or, sorry, in a familiar location, yeah. but obviously for most people, it's like a bedroom, a house, um, and attaching the the content to certain uh, furniture, let's just say, and also in a way that maybe has a logical flow. So let's say, imagine just walking up your steps and you go past a bunch of different pictures or something and you attach different things to yeah. that. So that way you can find the logical sequence again if you get lost. Exactly. And I think I just added something onto that, which he didn't mention, but I've read a bit around memory palaces and stuff, is the idea of making it quite visual making it quite like being able to introduce different aspects to it that are more memorable, right? Because if it's very abstract, yeah. it's very difficult to put something really abstract in your living room. You know, you want to make it like really visual and concrete and something that would trigger and almost like exaggerate yeah. certain aspects of it. You know, like I've, I've yeah. read around like, you know, when you're, I remember trying to learn the different, what was it? Um, Shakespearean plays you know, and there's like taming okay. of the shrew. And so you have like a giant mouse trying to jump through a tiny hoop or something like that. So they're, they're, they're ridiculous concoctions, but the idea is that your brain is more likely to remember something that's pretty strange rather than like pretty normal. Um, yeah, you're not going to just like attach it to uh, identical pictures yeah. because there's no differentiating factor or anything that sticks out about it, right? Or maybe even stuff that you just... You don't even remember seeing in the room like the carpet or something like that or the floorboards exactly um, exactly so yeah now quick check at the end of the chapter so are you clear on what you'd like to memorize have you decided which memory technique you're going to use and have you practiced your explanation without notes so now that we've verbalized and we've memorized we're going to move on to step seven which is questions yes so you may not control when or what you speak about, similar to how Roger Federer doesn't control the serves he receives. However, like him, you can influence how you respond. So predicting the questions. Anticipate likely questions based on the subject and the individuals and the potential area of interest. Think about what questions would naturally arise. What could someone ask to challenge you? Are there questions you hope to avoid? Are there peripheral topics that might be brought up? And can you gather information about the questionnaires? The next task is to split the list into three. So you want questions you think you can answer, questions you need to work on how to answer, and question three, or part three, is questions you need, to, uh, you need new information to answer. I think this is super interesting because this is how, if you really want to get like, uh, deep expertise in a specific topic. Mm. Um, you probably want to be doing this sort of as an exercise, you know, if like, you know, if somebody was going to come and challenge this idea that I have, how would I combat those challenges? Are there questions that, you know, maybe I'm hoping to avoid because, you know, I realize when I get asked them, the limitations of my own knowledge, yeah. it's, it's just quite an interesting frame for even just, yeah, refining ideas or theories you have, right? Absolutely. It's, you know, yeah. if, if there's a question out there, which really stumps you, then that's a good, place to start looking for maybe maybe you don't know as much as you think right mm. like it's a classic case of like when where most people have or we all have to some degree like the dunning-kruger effect in certain areas of our lives and the moment you press somebody for like okay well we were talking yesterday about what, uh, on this podcast about what's the source yeah. you know <laughs> where did you hear that and it's like once once you start labeling it, oh yeah i saw it on twitter it's like okay well was it a valid source you're like mm, yeah you're probably right it's not maybe yeah, the yeah. best place to 
you know, base my knowledge off, but is that type of thing, right? And I think that is a really important one there. So the questions you hope to avoid, yeah. because for me, that's one of those things that like, there's probably a reason why you're hoping to avoid it. And it's the fact that you realize you don't know as much as you think. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I think the more you do this, right? Like you might be explaining this to one person, but you'll probably go on to explain it to multiple people. So the more you do this, the more familiar you'll come with, you know, from that angle of that question. And mm. I reckon you could very much improve your expertise on a particular area by considering questions from different types of people, people who are coming at it from different yep. angles, right? So like, yeah, you might be answering a journalist or something like that, but what about yeah. a politician? Or what would a religious person religious say? What would uh, this type of person say? Yeah, exactly. And because you're, you're coming at your concept from multiple different angles and it makes you think about it from the, their perspective. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think it's super useful. It's almost like you want to go into the frame of mind that potentially you might have to debate what you're talking about. Because then with debating, obviously, you have to come up with the counter arguments, right? The counter positions. And it's kind of like you use that to refine your own understanding because mm -hmm. you're always asking yourself, where is this wrong? Where is, this, where is the frame that changes the meaning of what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Like you said, yeah, questions you need to work on how to answer, right? It, it reveals to you your own ignorance to some degree. Oh, wait, I can't answer that question. Fantastic. Now I've got a place to look at, which I need to refine. And I feel like if you start doing this process, like you're saying here, eventually you're going to feel very confident or more confident in your ability to explain something because there's not going to be too many questions that could possibly throw you off. Yes. Exactly. Whereas if, if you go into an explanation or communication or uh, uh, public speaking or whatever, and you know, deep down, there's a few questions that you want to avoid. You're going to be pretty like, you know, on edge yeah. when it gets to the question yeah, round yeah. and people are like, oh, what about this? You're just like, oh, fuck. It's like when people do are doing their exams you know? and they're like, fuck, I hope that question doesn't come up because they're basically yeah. thinking yeah. that topic. Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah, it's a good point because I think, you, yeah, you shouldn't use this just as, oh, that person probably won't ask that question. It's not about the questions that they're really asking. It's about, you know, can I kind of develop my understanding of this even better so that I can be well equipped if they answer the questions if they ask the questions you know yeah i think it's just good for this even just for the self-confidence reason you know if you if you know there's sort of holes in your knowledge and you're always going to be on edge that somebody's going to point them out to you and you're going to look like a bit of a like an idiot i guess but then, then to be fair later on i don't want to jump the gun but he does talk a lot about trying to avoid obviously stuff you don't know like he doesn't advocate for speaking about things you don't mm, know yeah and there, there are always going to be questions right that people are going to bring to you because unfortunately we don't have enough time to contemplate the 10 billion different frames you could attach to anything yeah. you know yeah that's no, so true um so on to the next section then plotting your answers for some questions a simple yes suffices while others may require a more elaborate response pulling in relevant pre-prepared strands the key is to be relevant efficient and clear considering the time constraints. When facing the first question, prioritize the strands that best address it. Handling tough questions is crucial, as ignoring them can impact your confidence. Anticipate and prepare at least a basic response for questions requiring more information, understanding that a little preparation goes a long way. And I, I, I think, I keep coming back to this. There's a, I think we can trick ourselves into thinking like, oh, if I know something, I, I'm fine. I can do it off the back of it. But like, you have to prepare, I think, to some extent. You mm. really do. It's not like it, it, you're not a novice or a rookie for doing so. I think you're literally just preparing yourself. I think goes. Well, you call, you're fat, funny enough, you're probably more of a professional. Exactly. Yeah, like, yeah, even yeah. for like 10 minutes. You know? Yeah. Um, I was saying this to you, wasn't, wasn't I? Um, the Alex Hormozzi quote, which is something like, even doing 10 minutes of preparation raises your IQ points or perceived IQ points by like 20, 30. Because when you come into a meeting or anything where you, you know, you have to communicate an idea just by taking 20 minutes beforehand to figure out what it is you want to say and, and then say it makes you look way better than somebody who gets up and goes, fuck, I haven't really thought this yeah. through and just, you know, waffles <laughs> yeah. for 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. No, it's so true. Um, yeah, I think it's bad. It's cool. I'll take the next one then, mate, because it's a, it's a long, a long old slog. Oh, so is. answering questions in the moment. So preparing in advance significantly extends our response time. By organizing and internalizing information beforehand, we relieve our brains uh, so they don't have to do it in the moment. Practicing potential questions enhances our ability to address them effectively. Our objective has always been to approach topics from various angles and sequences. Anticipating potential questions sharpens our awareness during conversations. For instance, if a question hints at a familiar topic, we sif uh, swiftly navigate our mental repository to craft a tailored response. For instance, again, if a recognizable word appears in a question, 
after three seconds and the question spans 17 seconds, you have a 14 second window to assess your mental inventory and determine the sequence for presenting your information, which I thought was quite interesting. Mm. Like they mentioned this, maybe like interest rates already in the first five seconds. I now got to have to go back into my head. What do I know about interest rates, et cetera? What is, what have I been studying recently or what is my, what links do I have to this in my explanations? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why it's so important to kind of have those strands ahead of time, right? Because if we have a strand that's on, you know, interest rates and we know that we've got the primary like point, we've got the three facts, we've got the context, then already that's been triggered. That chunk is there. And so, you know, as soon as we hear that, we're like, okay, bam, I've already got that one. And then I know that that strand links to this strand, right? And so you've already got a kind of plan just from going off that, like, you know, the trigger words in the questions. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, I, I guess this works like 90% of the time. I do worry though sometimes or maybe he's, or the person who's questioning you, he, she, and they say that word that you've got this topic um, thought about, but then, cause obviously the question's way longer than that. It actually ends up being something completely different to what you prepared. Yeah. And then you just come back with the stock answer and then they're just like, the fuck? I just, I can I ask you something completely different. Cause I'm sure that can happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cause there is a, there is a point where, you know, we talk a lot about like active listening and stuff. It's, if you just pick the first thing and just start, you know, reading off ideas, you might actually miss the point. But yeah, I do agree yeah. that you should have pre-prepared answers to, to strands and stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so yeah, selecting and sharing the structure. As you hear the question, consider which strands to use in your response. Similar to explanations, core messages remain consistent, but the ordering varies based on the context. For instance, in an interview about managing others, you might structure your answer like this. I'd emphasize three aspects of my career, my experience at X, my previous work at Y, and my volunteer work at Z. Um, it's funny because we don't really think about stuff like that, but it's probably mm. worth when you're going into like a job interview, yeah. having like a structure to your to your pitch. I think it helps you and it also helps them, right? And, yeah. and I, uh, yeah, I think it's, oh yeah, such a good point, isn't it? Because you kind of walk in with your CV and a lot of CVs just dump loads of yeah. shit. And it's just like, you need to come in, like you said, with like strands, like, Strand A, I'm I'm dependable person. Here's the points. Boom, boom, yeah. boom. I'm a hard worker. Boom, 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 boom. And then you just <laughs> you go through them, right? Yeah, the kind yeah, of thing. yeah, absolutely. I, I'm s starting to see the value in that a lot more. And also just having like a bit of a plan that's not like hierarchical or chronological, but just they're connected. It's like he might talk about point B first, so I can talk about point B and then I can reference point A and then go to C or something like that. Um, yeah. It's funny because I don't think people as well take the time to actually think about maybe their strengths and how they you know go about conveying them you know so like in the past like i haven't been to too many job interviews right but i if somebody's asked me like what are you good at unless you've got a pre-prepared answer with a few different like um things you think you're good mm -hmm. at right you can then actually get stuck in the whole many different ones that you possibly could say but you don't have any structure in your head so you're just like you almost panic because you're like oh what, what should i say what should i say whereas at least if you've you know kind of got these strands of like yeah i've got this in my re like repository mm -hmm. i also good at this i'm good at this and here's the points to back it up it almost helps you with your confidence a little Absolutely. bit because you've actually thought through how was i actually like this because if you if you don't take the time to actually take stock and put it down at like the points related to your skills you might not realize how many skills you actually have. Yeah. And I reckon the concept of structuring your thinking and your explanation like that will start to implicitly make you think like that as well. Because I've had it yeah. where, you know, the things that I'm best at explaining about are things I've already talked a lot about, you know, that I've, yes. you know, when I'm reading a book and I come across this amazing concept and then I have like three or four conversations that week with someone um about that and then when i come on here and i'm explaining that point it's a lot more succinct it's a lot more precise because my brain has already dealt with a lot of different ways that i can say it and has now put it into a nice succinct way if you get what i mean yes and i think you come with more emotion and, and confidence in what you're mm. saying you almost it's funny isn't it we almost use like each other as like tester grounds for the ideas like oh i just saw this really yeah, cool yeah. idea like da -da 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 -da. Yeah. And then maybe if we don't, most of the time, to be fair, I feel like whenever you come to me an idea, we usually get it quite quickly. Yeah. Like there isn't actually too much. Like, I, I also feel like as well, when you really do like an idea, it sticks immediately and you can communicate it quite well. But maybe that's just the fact that the person who communicated the idea to you was also very mm. clear and good at it, maybe. Um, <laughs> but I, I feel the same as you, man. Like it's the stuff which you speak a lot about. You feel more confident saying, and it is that thing where, 
I, I think we're both the same in this in this respect. Like when we read certain things, we're like, "That's a really cool idea." Mm. We almost feel like we have to share it. Yes, and then that and it in turn helps us get better at communicating it. Absolutely, and I think you're right on the money with it allows you to get your emotions and confidence across. I think when you're thinking yep. about the words or you don't really know how it's structured and so you're going really carefully about it, then it you can't get your whole self across. And so you're less engaging, right? And whereas when you know something properly, then you can really go into depth about it and you can get the, that emotion across and your tonality and your melody and it just is a lot more engaging, which I reckon helps the other person also receive it and understand it i think it also helps with the motivation of the other person it's almost like a a, a, a signal of this information is mm. interesting because i'm so excited about it you should be excited <laughs> about it whereas if you say it in a really monotone way they're like this guy's fucking yeah. boring why should i care yeah. about what he's saying yeah. you know when you come in with a bit of like passion and you explain it in a good way i think they think wow this guy's you know gone out of his way to like tell me about this it must be important mm. kind of thing yeah no absolutely <laughs> it's funny yeah <laughs> What were you laughing yeah, at? <laughs> you had some weird I experience with this, have you? so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's um, it. <laughs> all right, so on to mirror language. So be careful not to appear disconnected from the question. While structuring your response, actively listen to the question uh, questionnaire's language and incorporate it into your answer. And I think that's quite quite a good point as well. You know when you've seen someone answer a question and they answer using the specific words? You know, so it's, they're yeah. really referencing the question. And so it's like they've really been listening. And I, I think then the, the recipients is really like tuned in. Be like, okay, well, he actually heard me. I'm kind of curious what this answer is going to be. Um, I think that's quite an important point. For sure. I mean, if you misquote them, it's never going to go down well, is it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think what you said is this is the complete yeah. opposite. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, okay, so saying what you want to say. Whether faced yeah. with questions that skirt around a desired topic or unrelated inquiries, adeptly guide the conversation by strategically steering towards the territory you wish to explore. Take a brief detour related to the question and smoothly return to it. Use escape phrases to steer away from undesired questions and guide the conversation to more favorable topics. Think of escape phrases as quick verbal maneuvers akin to joining phrases, I guess, um, or bridging phrases and redirecting the conversation to more favorable topics. So some of these consist of absolutely and equally crucial is, or that is a valid point and related to it is something completely unrelated. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sounds like a Yeah, exactly, it does, doesn't it? It's like really skirting around the answer. So it's like, did you do this, yes or no? Well, it's worth considering very- Well, it depends actually. what you define a party as, you know? <laughs> yeah. It depends on, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Classic. Yeah, so those are those are some. Um, I think that's actually a really important thing to have. And once again, like if you can get those into your repertoire, if you can really familiarize some yourself with some of those, because also yes, you might have like favorite phrases you go to, but unless <laughs> you're using them all the time, with the same person, no one's really going to clock onto them. You know, um, they're not going to be like, oh, he spent his whole day memorizing these phrases. I mean, to be the only time they're ever going to clock on is let's just say you've only got two in your repertoire and they keep asking you questions you don't want to yeah. answer and you yeah, just yeah, keep yeah. going. That's the valid point. Yeah. And related to that is every time they say something. I wonder if like oh, politicians yeah. just, there should be a study to see how many escape phrases people know and it will turn out that politicians yes. know like a ridiculous amount. Oh, I bet, mate. <clears throat> it's part of the training. Yeah. Uh, do you want to I think it's part of PR training, genuinely. Yeah. It has to be. The next one is ask, answering questions that you don't know the answer to. So... At this point, it's time to acknowledge your limits and shift to known areas. If necessary, stretch information, but prioritize substance over length. Stopping may lead to a more suitable follow-up question. Um, and I thought, yeah, there's, he does encourage, obviously, if you don't actually know the answer, no points or making it up. It's very much just like, look, I don't know the answer right yeah. now, but I can look it up or something like that. Or there's, There was escape phrase, I think, for something similar to this. It was more like phrases just to admit that you don't know and that you yeah. would reference it maybe in the future. So yeah, taking confidence from your preparation. When adequately prepared, simply being yourself is sufficient. In high pressure situations, the temptation to transform into someone else, someone better, may arise, but it's not recommended. And this is what pretty much we're saying earlier for like, you definitely gain confidence from preparation, whether it's preparation in terms of knowing your points, whether it's preparation in terms of the fact you've already practiced your explanation before, the phrases, like you just said, if you've just you know said them again and again to yourself, it will just come out quite naturally. Yeah. 
it just it does it, it like preparation it just makes sense like everybody does it right if you're professional let's put it this way whether it's sports or whatever you're usually putting in repetitions before you perform yeah no, absolutely so lastly then the uh unexpected is expected if you accept that the unexpected could easily happen when it does it's not a surprise and you're going to think through the situation much more clearly so yeah i think i've thought about this quite a lot actually and it's kind of you know you're reading the books on small mm. talk i was thinking one of the best things you could probably get from a small talk book would be great phrases like almost like escape awkwardness phrases yeah. or escape yeah. unexpected phrases um where you just have like stock things you say when something really throws yeah. you off to buy, either buy you time or, or I don't know, just make you feel more comfortable. Mm. Yeah. There must be certain phrases. I don't, I don't know. I don't have an example off the top of my head, but the ability to sort of, when something stumps you to buy yourself some time by saying something that you always say. Yeah. Um, but I wonder whether sometimes the best way is just to be humorous in the moment. I, I reckon you know, just trying to make a method, life of it. Yeah. A hundred percent. Um, yeah. Self depreciating as well. Like, ah. Oh, you got me. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. Kind of thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've seen I've seen uh, some where the idea is, for instance, you rock up to a conversation with a group of people and you always like carry a drink or like something that you can throw okay. away or fill up. So you can be like, oh, hey, do you mind if I like join you in conversation? And then if you want to leave, rather than make it awkward, just be like, oh, I'm just going to go and fill up this or I'm just going to throw this away. Yeah. Well, the classic is like going to go to the yeah, loo, right? Exactly. But Desperate yeah, for the that's the toilet, sixth sorry. time in the last 20 minutes <laughs> yeah so to finish the chapter then we have the the quick check so when you think of the main subjects you need to talk about are you concerned about any of them number two is have you gone over your list of expected questions and the very last quick check is are you taking confidence from all the preparation you've done and yeah this pretty much summarizes it isn't it it's you should focus on the stuff you're concerned about because that's going to reveal to you the obvious gaps in your knowledge and your explanation you need to be prepared for all the questions that you're probably going to be asked and then, yeah, you need to make sure that you're feeling confident because I feel like that's such a big part mm. of it. And if you don't say it with confidence, people aren't really likely to uh, to believe you in what you're saying as yeah. well. Yeah. So, yeah, that was the end of the seven step dynamic explanation. And now I think he moves on to the very last part of the book, which is quick explanations, <coughs> kind of like off the cuff, email based. Yeah. Less preparation. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, so quick explanations. Before engaging in a non-social conversation, contemplate what you wish to convey. Inquire, uh, inquire about and discover. So quick verbal explanations. Three essential queries to promptly address. So what topics do I intend to cover? Uh, what messages do I aim to convey? And what inquiries do I want to pose? So short written explanations. Individual emails and messages, although seemingly insignificant, often offer opportunities to convey your message effectively and save resources. A clear initial message minimizes subsequent questions, saving time and improving interactions, ultimately enhancing your reputation. And then my assumptions when I write an email. And this is Ross, obviously, not my assumptions. Um, <laughs> producing effective written explanations require acknowledging the context and potential success factors. When writing emails, consider five key assumptions. Number one, the recipients uh, may not read at all. Number two, they may skim rather than read thoroughly. Number three, engagement is functional. Number four, content should be tailored to functional needs. And number five, personalization is crucial for engagement. And I think those are pretty pretty important things. I remember when I, when I was reading it, I was like, I'm kind of guilty of all of those things, um, like not reading it yeah. all, skimming it. I mean, if it's if there's too much text straight away and it's not important, then I don't care. Yeah, it's one of these things that I notice. I used to do it quite a lot on my WhatsApp. So, for example, I always structure my WhatsApps with breaks. Mm. I don't like to mass text somebody. I like to like break it up. Like here's line. I do. I'm still very guilty of potentially overdoing like a paragraph in the yep. middle. Um, but I always try and break my information up if I have time, especially on emails these days. I try and like, especially when you're trying to get like three points yes. across, you just have to be like one, two, three, and just have the point underneath yeah. it. Because if you just put it in a paragraph, it's so hard to just, and people won't put no, it out. They won't. I've noticed, I've noticed the differences between emails where if you send it with points, they usually respond with the points back and like a different mm. color, which is perfect because they're answering it by it but if you put in like three questions in one or three points in one they will usually miss one or two 100 yeah. yeah, yeah. they'll just reply to one yeah. and just ignore the rest no it's really important and i uh, i tell you what i actually am very guilty of this where i'll read 
the WhatsApp as it comes through on my like, you know, um, on my locked iPhone, right? And um, yeah. if it's anything functional, or anything that I need to reply to, then I do it. Otherwise, I don't. I just wait because I don't really like reading and going on my phone that much. So it's yeah. almost more important to make it really succinct and function like the purpose is straight away to be like this You're is what doing the email the text is going to yeah. be about bam 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 you know um yeah that is that you're not yeah. if you're not having like a proper conversation that is of course yeah no for sure so here we go we've got ev- enhance email effectiveness by employing two strategies so one of them is craft a subject line and initial sentence directly relevant to the recipient or content and number two is keep the email concise so in professional settings directness is appreciated but with unfamiliar contacts introduce yourself briefly Additionally, utilize short paragraphs, formatting, and headers for easy readability. Provide all necessary details in one location and avoid group messages, which may decrease response rates. And I actually had a few notes on my own mm. one, which because he did a really good example where if you're catering to like a group message, he kind of talked about splitting it into like two paragraphs, like four speakers. Uh, sorry, yeah, it was for the it was for like a presentation, mm. or like a speaking or public speaking gig, and he wanted to, he broke up the email into. One heading was four speakers, gave them the detail of the itinerary. Then the next down, four technical team itinerary. And it's just a good way of just, I mean, most people do get that's how you should probably do it. But it was, I just thought it was interesting to know it explicitly. It's like if you're if you're speaking to two separate groups, break the message into two groups and signal which one you're speaking to with like bold and headlines. Um, yeah, I, I, I do think it's really important. I remember coming across or reading um, the four hour work week and he went on about it quite a bit, Tim Ferriss. Because the idea is that you just don't want to have to do like 30 replies, right? If you can like write a message and be like, if this is this, then this, if not, then do this. Or like, like you said, if you're talking to a group of people, for those who are in this group, here's the instructions. For those who are in this group, here are the instructions, right? You just, and it's like, and once you follow them, follow this, you know, you want to make it as straightforward as possible so that you're not constantly bombarded by emails and texts and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, I got a few, I got a few like, ex, like, um, expansions of what we just said as well. So I took a note of the idea of having a direct subject line. So that one that speaks directly to the recipient, mm. like he was, he was basically arguing if you put their name in, they're more likely to know it's for okay, them, yeah. you know, like yeah. Jill or yeah. Jess, you know, we're yeah. more like, okay, it's for definitely for me. And then I thought the really important part, which most people don't do, and I'm definitely guilty of not doing it is a clear opening statement. So starting with a sentence that clearly states the email's purpose, like this is an email to decide when yeah, we're yeah. going to do this. This is an email for you to do this. Do you kind of get what I mean? This is an email that I need an answer to yeah. immediately. You know, it's urgent then. It's that type of thing where there's almost too much waffle and the communication's kind of yeah. lost. Whereas if you just state up like the purpose of this email, you could almost have like a template, hey, name, and then like brackets, purpose of this email, yeah. and then you just put it in, you know? No, absolutely. And absolutely then context agree. below it. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, that was a, a primer on sending emails. I thought it was quite an interesting part to add to mm. the book. And I actually, it's one of some of the most actionable stuff, actually, because you can put it immediately into the way oh, you, you send emails. So um, yeah, the quick reference at the end of this chapter and the end of the book is one, explain the message in the first sentence. Number two, is your message as short as possible? Three, is it formatted to be skimmable? Four, is it easy to respond to? And five, have you answered the reader's questions? You could literally like once again, copy and paste these questions into an email template. So whenever you press a new email, these come up to remind you, you know, have I explained it in the first yeah. sentence? Is it as short as possible? Absolutely. Because, you know, you basically what you want, especially from, you know, now that we finished the book, I think a lot of the utility from this book is extracting his sequences, his steps, running through them a few times until it becomes second nature. Cause he even said like, he, he obviously has this as a checklist, but it's become so normal to his behavior because he's been through it multiple times that it, that it, that is like, yeah, natural to him now. Right. And for, for anybody starting something new, obviously this is not going to be natural, but for example, even with this, this, this one right here, just having these five bullet points, maybe whenever you start a new email, whenever you you're about to see somebody or something, I don't know, just to remind you of the structure of your thinking or the way you should be addressing yeah. this. No, absolutely. I think it's really invaluable. And I I really want to start implementing it. And I think for yeah, people that are listening to this, whether it's a presentation or a speech or an essay or whatever, I think, you know, you can implement these things directly into it, whether it's the anatomy, like, you know, the seven step guide. Um, But I think you'll definitely start to see I think you'll definitely start to see a lot of value from it. And you'll start to realize, oh, wow, like, okay, 
there's, there's value in, in being able to explain things in a proper way so that other people can actually understand me rather than me tripping over my words and impeding my like confidence and everything like that. So I think it is, and it's directly in line with what we said that we're going to be doing, like focusing on communication. So I'm definitely. An explanation. Yeah, right? exactly. in, in my head, it, one of the biggest things you can kind of do, because obviously a lot of the, the steps, if you think about it across, you know, the main explanations to dynamic explanations, a lot of it is just, finding out the core essential elements of what it is that you're trying to explain and removing everything else mm. and then keeping doing that again and again until you've got you know the, the absolute bare bones of what you need to say mm. and then think about how you structure it practice it then perform it it's 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 pretty much as simple as that in my head yeah and i i think you know the conversations we tend to have with people are normally conversations we've kind of had before, right? There's certain interests that we have that we like to talk about, we like to bring up. So I guess this is a pretty good guide in if you have certain things that you're very, very much interested in, why not apply this kind of method? So that whenever you have a conversation, why not refine your explanation? Exactly. Yeah. Why not? Why not be able to say it the best you possibly yeah. can? So if you if this is something you're passionate about, you can communicate it with everybody. Yeah in the most concise and understandable way. It just makes sense. You know you're going to bring it up. It's like, I know that I like calisthenics and I talk to a lot of people about it. So if I can explain it in a, in a succinct and, you know, comprehensible manner, um, and I can keep improving on that, and then I have those strands and they're ready to go. It's like, I, I think that will give me a lot more confidence. And then I'll probably want to start doing that with other areas because I'll start to see people who are actually engaging with what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me a little bit I want to see if I can find the quotes from somewhere. There's something, it was like Gowinda when he talks about like most people, when you ask them for their opinion on something, they like, they just, just sort of grab the, the most recent bit of information they have in their brain related to it, create their opinion and then think that opinion is like well-informed. Mm. And it just makes you realize when you think about working through like this explana explanatory framework, sorry, you're literally thinking about the points that link to this. Like you're actually thinking of multiple points and how they all logically make sense. Whereas most people, when they ask for an opinion stuff, just pull out of their ass sort of thing and then convince they know yeah. it. Whereas this approach is kind of way more methodical, logical. And basically at the end of it, you're going to feel so confident because you're like, well, I've actually fought through all the points and all the questions. Yeah. And I now actually am relatively, I guess you could say, educated on the subject because I know the main points that are actually relevant because I've shifted, like sifted, sorry, for all the bullshit removed everything that doesn't matter and now i've got this stuff yeah. here whereas everybody else kind of sees stuff on the news here there and everywhere you know gets asked a question about it pulls out like using the availability heuristic like the most recent bit of information they've heard about it and then thinks oh wow i know it yeah you're gonna be you're gonna seem so much better and also i think like there's probably certain things that you could do certain topics that you know give you a lot of reputation and build a lot of credibility um, you know, whether that's like conversations that come up with your boss quite a lot, because once you've done the hard work, it's there, right? That lattice work mm. is there. So you can just use it. And because it's something that you'll probably be talking about a bunch of times, it will just get more and more ingrained. So when you sit down, you do this kind of methodical approach to it and you do that preparation, well, then it was just going to start to pay off down the line. I just, I think one of the things I, when we've just been reviewing this part now, I, I think one of the best things you can possibly do, and I, I've never done this myself, and I'm actually going to go off the back of this and probably do it, is being very clear on the strands of your personal value. Mm. So like, what am I good at? Let's look into like the locker. What have I done in my life? Can I think of the three best skills? And then can I make some main points around them? So when anybody ever asks me like, why should I hire you or whatever? Why should I trust you? Whatever. You just go like, well, here you yeah. go. And when you say it, you'd be like, I can prove that I'm like this because I've done this, this, and this. They're going to be like, fucking hell, like, wow, he came out with confidence and he knew exactly what yeah, he needed to yeah. say. Whereas if you asked me that now, I wouldn't have an answer for you. And I'd probably come across as unsure because I'd be, you know, pulling it out of my ass basically. And that is, I think what separates people who, you know, probably go really far in general in, in their careers and stuff is when they have a structured idea, idea of their own value. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I completely agree. Um, but like once again, this isn't just for that. It isn't just for, you know, structuring your own value, but it's like ev everything, everything, right? everything in my head could benefit from the clarity of refining what you think yeah. to the essentials and then finding that, you know, the bullet points. Well, it's kind of, and just, it's kind of like those, um, you know, in habits where you have like keystone habits, right? And in this, it's like, find those mm -hmm. kind of keystone subjects, those topics that you, that are going to come up multiple times in your life. And, you know, the value of yourself and how to get, how to communicate that is definitely one of those. And if you can apply this method to that, then you're always like, you're 
kind of always ready, you're always going to look quite confident and sure of yourself. And I think that's going to go a long way. Yeah. And I think, I think on the, just before we finish as well, but on the topic of that, you know how earlier, earlier on in the podcast, we were talking about that uh, sort of earned credibility. There's, I feel like so many people have things that they could literally use as prime examples of, of things that, you know, oh, I've been playing team sport for years. I've been the captain of my club for three years. I know how to like run, I um, be a leader. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. Things that people don't probably think about in a business perspective, but also showcase the earned credibility that they have over time. And having that as part of your strands. It's just I've only just like thought of this now. I'm like, that's just yeah, people need to be more sure and more have more like points on themselves, let's just yeah. say. I think it's a really useful tactic. I, I wonder if that I feel like Jordan Peterson does a lot of that with his self authoring, doesn't he? Or whatever. That's like sort of core yeah. sort of part of it. It's kind of describing or learning yourself, then learning your skills and then being able to articulate your skills. But yeah. I'm, I'm kind of excited to start implementing this now. Uh, yeah, I mean, with everything, right? Like, I mean, we're going to, off the back of this, potentially for the next book summary, maybe even try and create a section of, of strands, maybe and maybe even try and run a book summary off yeah. strands rather than uh, less of a script and stuff mm. like that and just see how we get on with this. I think it's it's really important. I feel like if you can get the strands down to like the main, main key points, it's, it's, it's probably good enough as long as you internalize what you're trying to say. Yeah, I agree. I can already th- just think of the power of it if you just if you're just clear, and it doesn't even take like you said like it doesn't take twenty points. You can literally just have three mm. or, or four, and as, if they if they link as well, it's even better, right? It's not not as difficult to remember. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that was the art of explanation. And what are we doing next? I can't remember. I think we said we we're going to do uh, talking to anyone anywhere. The Larry, Larry King, King book. book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah, well, I think it's talking to everyone. It's quite a confusing title. Place? It's like how to talk to anyone, anywhere, all at once. No, Any not place? all at once. <laughs> all, at, all at once? Maybe? Yeah, I don't it? know. No, I can't actually remember. It's quite a complicated um, title. But don't let that put you off, uh, put it off you, you know? Um, yeah. So yeah, we'll bring that. At, well, we'll probably try and get that in within the next week, maybe. Um, yes. If time gives. And then we're, we're, we're off for two weeks. Um, and then we'll be mm-hmm. back with some more communication yes. books for 2024 exactly. exactly lovely well like subscribe subscribe and comment and we'll see you in the next one That's awesome.